Quiz on session. Film Judge Joe Malcolm is at. Good morning, folks. Every ha stay seated. Good morning. All right. I think we have all of our jurors. And we have a shot to start close to being on time. Talk to me. Um, Pribble jumped up fast. Go ahead, Mr. Pribble. I waited for this objection. All right, everybody, just stop, stop. Everybody use formal names. I, I'm tempted as a judge because I'm, I try to have such an in, informal, nice way of calling the lawyers by their first name. And I, I try, it's very hard for me not to say, uh, all right, Rache, what are you doing? Let's just, that's an easy way to handle it. Everybody use formal names. Okay, no problem. Wonderful. Okay. All right. We have stuff to do in the interim, though. Everybody's doing a fine job. Thank you to both sides for working so hard. Eleven B. Eleven B. All right. So back on the record, there is a question about two ninety four. Yes, it was ID only. Miss Lancy wanted it, and we can stipulate to an admission if you'd like to transmit the transcript. Done. It's admitted. That's Exhibit two ninety four, which is a three fifty seven Magnum. All right, that's in evidence now. Yes. And Ms. Mixon, are you ready? Yes. Both sides are ready? Great. Deputy Dunkley, let's get the jury in here. Sure. are tricking us now. If we didn't know you all so well, we'd get confused. Uh, sometimes in shorter trials, I do, I'll do two in a week or so, and it's hard then to remember so many people. But we've spent so much time together, and I, I do appreciate it. Hopefully you never get tired of me saying thank you, because it really is heartfelt. I know that uh, all the participants uh, feel the same way. When I first got this job 16 years ago, my friends were like, oh, that, that's just got, that's really great. That's really cool. It looks, I said, listening intently is really hard. And uh, making decisions over and over and over. And uh, big decisions. It's a very difficult thing. So I, uh, I get it as a judge how hard it is to be a juror. So I thank you. You guys are great. And you've been so... There are juries, when I'm dealing with them, that make really angry faces at me because they're frustrated, they're tired, uh, they can't come to grips with um, that sometimes the lawyers have, they're juggling a million different things. And uh, I don't know if I said this in front of you, but I, I think I did. I haven't forgot what it's like to sit in those seats. And uh, you go back to your office and you got a million phone calls to return and it's, it's um, it's hard to be them. So I thank the attorneys for working so hard, and they've been very civil and professional to the court. You've noticed that, I think. 
and it's not always that way, trust me. So, with that being said, everybody's good and ready to go? Fantastic. State, what are you going to do first? Uh, State's going to call Detective Danielle Hirsch. Detective Hirsch, come on up, and good morning. Good morning. And come right on out here. We've got uh, some plugs, so be careful. And once you get out there by Deputy Junker, you're going to face Damien right over here. And then you're going to have a seat right up here. Chair swivel. Microphone moves. It's really important to me that you get that microphone directly in front of your mouth, center it up. And once you're all comfortable and you got the microphone where you'd like it, if you would tell us your full name and slowly spell your last name for us. Danielle Hirsch, H I R S. CH. Terrific. State, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Will you tell us how you're employed? I'm a detective with the Jupiter Police Department. How long have you been with the Jupiter Police Department? Since April of 1998. And did that begin your law enforcement experience? No, I uh, worked for the Lake Worth Police Department from um, January of 1995 till April of 1998. And then you went to? Jupiter Police Jupiter. Department. Um, can you tell us briefly about your training experience that you've had as it relates to law enforcement? Sure. I've been a, a, a police officer for almost 24 years. Um, I have about 1,000 hours of extra training in um, homicides, uh, robberies, child abuse, um, and I've been a detective at the Jupiter Police Department for almost 15 years. Okay. As a detective, and is that your current title, detective? Yes. Okay. And, and February 5th, 2017, were you also a detective? Yes. Okay, and as a detective with the town of Jupiter, do you respond to calls throughout the entire city or town of Jupiter? Yes. Is it general crimes, meaning you may do homicides or you may do robberies, et cetera? Correct, we're general assignment. Okay. Uh, I want to turn your attention to shooting that happened at 1105 Mohawk Street on February 5th, 2017, referred to as Super Bowl Sunday. Do you recall that? I do. Were you involved in that investigation? Yes. Okay. And at some point over the course of that investigation, did you get the assignment as lead detective? I did. Okay. And I, I, I want to ask you questions about the various scenes that were a part of this investigation and kind of lay things out and put things together as to how it is we got to um, the arrest of Mr. Vasada. Okay. Yes. February 5th, 2017, um, tell us how it is you initially start working this case. I was called out at about 11 p.m. Um, and asked to respond, as were most of the detectives in the uh, bureau at the time. Was due to the nature of the call and it ultimately finding out it was a triple homicide, was this an investigation that was a, a all hands on deck? Yes. Okay. And prior to or on your way to respond, uh, did you get any information as to um, what the nature of the crime was? Yes. What information did you have? I was, uh, I was informed that um, three people were killed at 11.05 Mohawk and that a fourth person was shot and they were, um, they were found at Paseo's Drive. When you initially get involved in the initial synopsis that you get as to the nature of the crime, are there any known persons of interest or suspects? Not at the time. So as you're heading in, do you go to the crime scene or do you respond somewhere else? No, I responded to St. Mary's Hospital to speak to the person that was uh, shot and was alive. So you are directed to St. Mary's Hospital? Yes. When you get there, do you know approximately what time it was? I'm going to say probably midnight or a little bit after. And when you get to the hospital, do you know who it is that you're looking for or you're hoping to speak with when you get there? Um, I'm not sure if I was told his name at the time, but I knew to ask for the person that was brought in, you know, from Jupiter. Okay. And did you go to St. Mary's and did you do just that? I you did. asked for the person that was brought in from Jupiter? Correct. And did you speak with someone that later became known to you as a Christopher Vasada? I did. And do you see Mr. Vasada in the courtroom today? I do. He's sitting at the uh, defense table with the glasses on. Beside the, he's got a white shirt on and a tie. Okay, we'd ask the record reflect the witness has identified Mr. Vasada. Noted. Okay. When you get to the hospital, where is it that you meet with Mr. Vasada? 
or you see him, I should say. So they have a trauma unit, and um, that's where I found him in the, I believe it was the first room to the right of the trauma unit. Was he being treated? He was. Okay. Did you notice any injuries to his body? I did. Okay, and what type of injuries did you notice? He had a very large, um, very large hole in his pelvis area. Okay. It was being treated. Was he still awake or conscious? He was conscious. At this point, do you attempt to speak to him to, f to get some information? I did. Was this a fact-finding interview or more of a formal interview? It was a fact-finding interview. What's the purpose of a fact-finding interview? Just to give us some information as how we should, where we could go, or who we could possibly talk to, or, or just what happened. So were you, at this point, are you trying to gather as much information as you could from Mr. Vasada relating to how it is he got these injuries? Yes. Okay. And was he able to provide you um, some statements? He gave me a, sh a short statement, yes. Okay, and did you ask Mr. Vasada what happened? I did. And what did he tell you? If you don't mind, I'd like to um, look at my report just so I'm... Refresh your recollection. Just so to be accurate okay. as exactly what well, he said to me. Not. Let me give you an instruction. Okay. So you're going to take a look at it. You're going to read it to yourself. Yep. And when you're done reading it, I want you to look up and then the state's going to have a question for you. Okay. Previous, okay. Same ruling. Ready? Ready? <laughs> okay. Um, I asked you if Mr. If you asked Mr. Basada some questions and what he responded to you. So can you tell us about that dialogue you had with Mr. Basada? I did. I asked him his name. He told me his name was Chris Rivasada. I asked him what happened to him. He said he was at his friend Charlie's house and he was sitting around a fire pit. He was shot from behind. He said at some point he felt himself being dragged uh, away and at some point he was dropped off, dragged away and put into a car and at some point he was dropped off. Um, I asked him if he knew who shot him. He said he didn't see the shooter. Um, I asked him if his friends were the ones that put him in the car and dropped him off, and he said he didn't know. Did you ask him any other questions? I didn't because he was getting ready to go into surgery, so he, I, I had to cut it short. So after this fact-finding interview with Mr. Vasada, are you still... Um, while you have some additional information, at this point you still don't know who a person of interest might be or any suspects? Correct. Okay. Now I want to back up just a second. Do you recall approximately what time uh, the 911 call came in? 10.34 p.m. was okay. the first one, I believe. Okay. Now, you testified that this was somewhat of an all-hands-on-deck uh, investigation from the very beginning, correct? Yes. Okay. You said that you responded to St. Mary's Hospital. Were there some um, detectives and officers that responded to the scene of 1105 Mohawk? Yes. Were there some officers and or detectives that responded to Paseo Sway? Yes. And during the course of this investigation, did you all communicate with one another and sharing information that you've obtained? Yes. And is that why some officers were sent to Paseo Sway when it was learned Mr. Basada was found there? Yes. Okay. During, after you leave, well, let me ask you this. Once Mr. Vasada goes into surgery, um, did you communicate with any other detectives that were working the case as well? I did. Okay, and who was that? Detective Sanders. When you communicated with, is it Detective Kelly Sanders? Yes. Okay. Um, did you communicate with her and tell her what information you received from Mr. Vasada? I did. And did you know that Detective Sanders had responded to Jupiter Medical Center? Yes. Okay, and did she meet with Charlie Vorpagel? She did. Did you provide Detective Sanders with the information or the statements that mm -hmm. Mr. Vasada made in, in hopes or in order for her to be able to communicate with, the communicate with Charlie about the information you had? I did. Okay, and at some point, you testified that Detective Sanders went to Jupiter Medical? Yes. And spoke with Charlie, Mr. Vorpagel? Yes. Did you receive a call back from Detective Sanders? I did. Okay. Um, did she communicate with you what it is she learned from Mr. Vorpagel as it relates to whether Mr. Vasada was in fact at his house that night as an invited guest? Yes. And did you learn that he was not an invited guest, meaning Mr. Vasada? I'll rephrase. Please. Based on the information that you received from Detective Sanders, 
after she spoke with Mr. Vorpagel, and you've communicated with her what Mr. Vasada told you. Did Mr. Vasada become a person of interest? He did. Okay. Now you've told us that there were law enforcement officers that responded to Paseo's way. Yes. Um, the scene of 1105. Yes. Mohawk. Um, Jupiter Medical, correct? Yes. And you responded to St. Mary's Hospital. Correct. Were there also officers that were back at the station working on search warrants? Yes. As for one of the search warrants, was there a search warrant done for the actual residents of 1105 Mohawk? There was. Were you all able to obtain consent from Mr. Vorpagel to search the residents, 1105? We were. Okay. And despite him giving consent to you all to search the residents, why did you all still do a search warrant? Out of an abundance of caution, because of the case was uh, an important case, we wanted to make sure that we had all our things in order. So, so he gave you consent to search the house, but you all still just procedure did a search warrant for the residents. Correct. Okay. After you leave St. Mary's Hospital, where do you respond to? I responded to 1105 Mohawk. Was it still dark out, if you recall? Yes. Okay. And was your visibility limited? Yes. Okay, but where, did you walk in the backyard um, and observe three bodies in the backyard? I did. Did you observe a blood splatter, a blood-like substance that was on the concrete in the backyard? I did. And did you have an opportunity to see um, shell casings? I did. Okay. They were hard to see, but you could see a couple of them. Were you using a flashlight to assist you? Yes. Okay. Did you also see a Glock pistol that was back there? I did. Okay. How long would you say you stayed at the scene and now we've moved into the early hours of February 6, 2017, correct? Correct. We were there for most of the next day. Okay. And over the course of the investigation, um, are various detectives and officers responding back to you and communicating with you about information that they've received? Yes. While you're at, scene, at the scene at 1105 Mohawk, um, did you learn that Mr. Sean Henry's car was missing? I did. Okay. And did you learn it after speaking with Detective Sanders? Yes. Learning that his car was missing, what steps did you take in hopes of locating that vehicle? We put out a uh, be on the lookout for the car um, and that it was used, it was possibly related to a homicide. Um, and then on the, the next, the following day on the 6th at about 8.30 it was recovered. I want to back up for just a second. Okay. You told us that there were officers that responded to Paseo's way. Yes. Right? Everyone split up, went to different locations. Did you learn what was recovered at Paseo's way? I did. And as a, at some point, while you're at 1105 Mohawk, are you assigned as the lead investigator on this case? Yes. Okay. And as lead investigator, are you made known or aware of potential evidence that's collected, whether it be at the hospital, um, one of the crime scenes, roadside on I-95? Yes. And do you have an opportunity to view the various items that are collected by the crime scene investigators? Yes. Okay. And as a part of this investigation, did you learn that at Paseo's Way, where Mr. Vasada was found, there was a magazine with 40 caliber bullets um, and a glove recovered? Yes. Now, going back to 1105 Mohawk, you testified that you learned that Mr. Henry's car was missing, and there was a be on the lookout. Is that all? a bolo? Bolo, right. Okay. A bolo was um, put out for his car. On what date was it that you received information that Mr. Henry's car was located? On the 6th. So still that same day that right. you're on scene. Right. Okay, so all these things are happening the very next day. Correct. Okay. So once the car, it's learned that the car is recovered, can you, are you able to tell us the make and model of that car? A uh, Honda Accord. And was it a four-door car? It was a four-door car. Okay. You receive information that the that Sean Henry's vehicle has been located. 
Was that a different police agency? Yes, Palm Beach Gardens Police Department. And based on that, were there uh, law enforcement from Jupiter Police Department sent to respond to um, Palm Beach Gardens, I-95 in, in Palm Beach Gardens? Yes. Okay. And you talked about the sales way and having an opportunity to view that evidence that was recovered. Um, did you have an opportunity to review evidence recovered from the culvert on I-95? I did. Okay. And do you recall what those items were? A black hoodie, um, a set of gloves, a um, key keychain that belonged to a BMW, um, a rifle, and a revolver. Now, at this point, we know there's a lot of moving parts to this investigation. Are you aware that at the Paseo scene on the early morning hours of February 5th going into February 6th, that crime scene photographed the sales way? Yes. And as a part of, as a part of um, the photograph that were taken, do you have an opportunity to view photographs? Yes. Did you see a BMW that was photographed at the sales way where Mr. Basada was found? Yes. And would that have been somewhere between midnight on February 6th to maybe 2 a.m. in the morning, somewhere around that time frame? Yes, it, I think it was prior to that. Honestly. Okay, but it was late in, on the 5th going into the 6th. Correct. Okay, thank you. And in those photos, um, did you observe a BMW? I did. That was photographed as well? Yes. Okay. Initially, was there any information to suggest that this BMW was relevant in any way to the investigation? No. Okay. So going back to I-95, you told us about some items that were recovered in the culvert. Correct. Okay. Um, there was a black hoodie recovered. Yes. Inside of that black hoodie, were there items that were recovered within the pockets? Yeah, the, uh, a key ring that had a uh, black BMW uh, keychain on it. Okay. And about what time would you say this was? The, the uh, car was recovered around 8.30 in the morning on the 6th. Okay. The Honda? Uh, the Honda, sorry. Okay. Um, At this point, do you know the significance of the BMW key fob that's found in the pocket? No. Okay, so this is just another item, just like the rifles and the black hoodie and gloves that are recovered. Correct. Did you also have an opportunity to uh, review photos of a pillow in the back seat of Mr. Henry's car with a blood-like substance on it? Yes. Okay. Did you ever see any blood on the assault rifle? I didn't. Sean Henry's car that was found on I-95, do you recall where the keys were located? In the car. Okay. And may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Ford or Honda Accord belonging to Sean Henry? Yes. At this time, the state would offer into evidence? 3.30. 3.30. Any objection? 3.30 is admitted. And this car was not processed at the scene, correct? No. Okay. Were there some photographs taken of it? Yes. And subsequent to the photographs being taken, was the car then um, towed? Yes. Where was the car towed to, if you recall? Our impound lot. Okay. Now, you never went to, um, actually, let me show you one more exhibit. <clears throat> show you the 294 detective You talked about two firearms that were recovered in the culvert? Yes. And was this one of the firearms, this revolver, that was recovered? Yes. It has. Okay, I didn't hear your answer. You never responded to I-95. I did not. Okay, but you received information um, related to what was recovered from 
that scene. Right. Okay. Just as you had from Paseo's way. Right. Where do you spend most of February 6th? At 11.05 Mohawk. Did you take part in the search warrant executed on the actual residence? Yes. Okay. And inside, excuse me, of the residence, did you observe many firearms and narcotics inside? I did. And were all those items collected? Yes. Okay. Now, while you were um, at 1105 Mohawk, Did you receive information that a resident and the Paseos neighborhood um, called in regarding a suspicious vehicle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Leading up to this, is there anything to suggest that that BMW key that's found on I-95 is related to this BMW vehicle that although it's been photographed at Paseos Way, really has no relevance? Correct. It, it, at, at the time, we had no idea what the relevance of that car was. And after this residence in the Paseos neighborhood calls in regarding a suspicious vehicle, do officers respond to the Paseos neighborhood? Yes. Did you respond to Paseos neighborhood? I did not. Okay. Was there a BMW that becomes a car of interest as it relates to this triple homicide? Yes. Okay. Did crime scene respond there as they did to Mohawk and I-95 to photograph Specifically, this vehicle now. Yes. Okay. Um, and were these photographs of the vehicle different than the photographs that were taken, I guess, what would have been earlier that night, initially? Meaning, yes. were these photographs more isolated to the BMW? Correct. Okay. At some point, um, is that car towed as well? Yes. Okay. And where is that vehicle towed to? Or in Pan Lot. And did you all write a search warrant for that vehicle? We did. Okay. How is it that you all were able to gain access to this BMW? The keys that we recovered from the pocket of the hoodie were the keys that opened the door to the um, BMW that we took from Paseos. Okay. That BMW key fob. Correct. And you all used that key fob once the search warrant was executed to get inside of that BMW that was found at Paseos Way. We did. Okay. And were you present for the search of both the Honda as well as the BMW? I was. Okay. And the BMW that was searched, were you able to find any evidence inside um, belonging to or identifying Mr. Vasada as being the driver related to this BMW? Yes. Okay. And what, what did you find? In the driver's side pocket. We found um, his, uh, can I refer to my uh, report? Yes. I just want to be accurate on exactly what we found. Okay. Sorry, it's like a 40-page report. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Detective Hirsch. Yes. Um, inside of the vehicle, did you find an ID belonging to Mr. Vasada? We did. What about a cell phone? A cell phone, yes. Okay. Um, Inside of that vehicle, did you also locate um, a cell phone belonging to Marcus Stewart? Two of them. Okay. What about a rifle bag? Was there a rifle bag found in the vehicle? Yes. Um, was there any ammunition that was located? Yes. Okay. Now, going back to, just want to stick a pin in that for just a second, okay. um, ammunition that was found did you find any 40 caliber ammunition? Yes. Okay, was that Perfecta? Yes. Okay. Now you talked about, stick a pin in that, you talked about being at the scene at 1105 Mohawk in the backyard, right? Correct. 
and you talked about seeing three bodies and some blood, a blood-like substance. Yes. Uh, did you also see a firearm? Yes. Okay. And was that too a 40 caliber pistol? It was. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to see the magazine that was recovered from Mr. Vasada's pocket? I did. And was that also a 40 caliber live rounds? Yes. Okay. And those bullets that were recovered from Mr. Vasada's pocket, uh, did they match the bullets that were also found in Mr. Vasada's car? Yes, they were perfected. Okay. In addition to those 40 caliber bullets that were found in Mr. Vasada's car, as well as Mr. Vasada's pocket, and matching the gun at 1105 Mohawk, did you also find um, 762 bullets inside of the car? Yes. And where were those located? Those were located inside a, a sock that was tied up in the passenger front passenger um, door. Okay. And the items that we talked about, the, the ammunition that was found, um, were they found inside of a pink backpack in the vehicle? Yes. Okay. Were there also bullets to a revolver located? Yes. Now, in addition to searching the BMW, you said you all, you were present for the search of the Honda? Yes. Okay. And did you find mm -hmm. any um, clothing inside that you found to be relevant? Yes. What did you find? Uh, a hoodie and um, a glove in the backseat of the Honda. And then there was also a black t-shirt that was in the front of the Honda, the front seat, passenger's side. Was there anything in the back seat that was relevant to this investigation? Yes, the hoodie was in the back seat, a black hoodie and a, and a glove, a single glove. What about a pillow? Pillow with blood on it. Okay. Now there comes a point in your investigation that you issued or you executed, I should say, search warrants for DNA for several individuals, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And. Um, who were the three individuals that you um, got search warrants for and collected their DNA? Christopher Vasada, uh, Marcus Stewart, and Luke Kasukas. And when you collected those DNA um, swabs, those reference samples, were those reference samples submitted with other items of evidence submitted to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Okay. And did, were the firearms as well submitted with various items. Yes. Were there multiple rounds of items sent to the DNA lab for testing? Yes. How many items are you allowed to submit initially? Like nine. Nine items. Okay. And did you select nine items or submit items that you believe would be relevant and should be tested? Correct. Okay. Now, February 8th, 2017, did you meet with um, Charlie Vorpagel? I did. Although he had already spoken with, a de with Detective Kelly Sanders, why did you meet with him again? Because it was my case and I wanted to speak to him, get his story for myself and ask whatever questions that I had of him myself. In addition to speaking with Mr. Vorpagel, did you speak with many other people who may have said they had relevant information or potential information to assist in the investigation? Yes. And did you ask other detectives to assist you in getting potentially relevant um, surveillance videos? Yes. In one of the neighborhoods, um, going back to the Paseos neighborhood, was there surveillance videos that was recovered from a residence there? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to review that surveillance video? I did. Okay. I want to talk to you specifically about um, that area. That's what we call it, the FPNL access road. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that access road, um, do people do people exercise, run or walk down that path during the day? Yes. How would you describe the foot traffic on that path um, 
9 or 10 at night? Almost none. Is it, is it kind of an isolated area at nighttime? Yes. Okay. And if a person is on that path, is there a way for them to get to the neighborhood of where 1105 Mohawk is? Sure. About how far away is it? What is the distance between, um, let's say, the Paseos neighborhood near that FPNL access to 1105 Mohawk? Somewhere between a mile, a mile and a quarter. Okay. view um, surveillance video that was recovered from the Paseos neighborhood. Is that correct? I did. Okay. Is there a, a laser pointer up there with you? Oh, okay. You take this. I'm going to ask you to use that just to point out. And if you can't see, just let me know. Okay. Um, and Your Honor will allow you to step down. Okay. Can we dim the lights just a little bit if possible, Your Honor? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, um, Detective Kirsch, is this Via Zamora that we have right here? Yes. Okay, and is this Paseos Way? Correct, this is Paseos Way. Okay. And this cross street. Is via Zamora. Okay. And would the FPNL access path not shown here but be off to this side? Correct. Okay, so this would be west. Right. Okay, and I know it's not depicted here, but if we come over west and we were to go up, would that be the way to go to get to um, the neighborhood where 1105 Mohawk Street is located? Yes. Okay. And um, are you familiar with the timestamp on this surveillance video from one way to the other? I am. Okay. Was there any type of delay in the time? Ten minute delay. And you all were able to get from February fifth, two thousand seventeen video footage. Correct. Okay. And this in this um, still shot right here, um, we see two vehicles parallel parked, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the the vehicle that you all believe to be of interest, is it depicted here yet? No. So really the time here, it shows 9.28. Um, is it approximately 9.38? Correct. Okay. Okay, here. Is this a vehicle you believe to be of reference? Yes. Of, of, of significance? Correct. Okay, and you'd agree you're unable to make out exactly the make and model of the vehicle? Right. Okay. Um, and at some point, you, you can't even tell who the individuals are in the vehicle. Right. Okay. We see the vehicle park, correct? Yes. Now, where this vehicle parks, is there a stop sign there? Or close to I it's mean, not, yeah street. yes there's a cross street like right there okay. like in front of it kind of so is the vehicle this vehicle at what would be a parallel spot near the stop sign correct okay and this is the same vehicle that turns the lights on and off right. And we see this vehicle come back around, even though it's not depicted here. Are there houses that are on the west side of the street here? Yes. And is there a back street behind that goes that block of houses um, closer to the upfield access road? Correct. And is it you believe this to be the same vehicle that pulls out of the parallel spot initially? Yes.
And are you able to see movement? Right by there. Okay. And in a second, you'll see two people run this way. See them right there. Okay. So just so I'm clear, you saw movement at this dark color car. Correct. Okay. And it's a little blurry, but there's one, one and two. Yep. And two. Yes. Okay, and they are headed in a, <coughs> they're headed west. Yes. Okay, now, you would agree you're unable to say where these two individuals actually um, went to? Correct. Correct. Um, but you are aware that there is a access road um, to the west? Yes. Okay. Now I want to show you <clears throat> this clip. And while this is, oh, just a second. When you had an opportunity to review the video, um, did you watch it and in its entirety as it relates to the, the time frame that you believe to be relevant? Yes. Okay. And from the time we see two individuals exit this vehicle that's depicted here and head west, um, does that vehicle move? No. And I want to show you, it's in evidence, but I want to show you a, a portion. Um, at some point, did you also see footage of a vehicle coming back to um, the Paseos neighborhood at what appeared to be um, a higher speed than posted in this in a, in a neighbor in a neighborhood? Yes. Okay. And did you also see deputy sheriffs? Yes. Is there an objection to this point as the best evidence? I mean, the jury has to say, hang on, just tighten it up a little bit. Okay. De Detective Hirsch, is this the is this the scene that um, Jupiter law enforcement officers in crime scene um, were sent to to process? Yes. Okay. And video was collected from the residence 108 via Zamora. Correct. Now you testified that there were three individuals that you got search warrants for, for DNA, for their DNA, correct? Yes. And that was a Christopher Vasada, Marcus Stewart, and a Luke Kasukos. Yes. Okay. During the course of the investigation, uh, did the name Luke Kasukos come up? Yes. And as part of your investigation, Um, and Lucas Sukos potentially being a person of interest, did you also pursue potential investigative leads as it relates to him? I did. Um, now, we know that there was surveillance footage that you checked for in a lot of different locations. Um, did you check for surveillance footage as it relates to Lucas Sukos? Yes, officers obtained that. Um, did you check cell phone tower records? Yes, we did. As it relates to where he may have been and where 11 or 5 was. Yes. Um, did you check DNA results? You testified you got his DNA sample. Did you check the DNA results? I did. As it relates to evidence collected pertaining to the triple homicide? Yes. Okay. Did you speak with his alibi witness? I did. Okay. And as a result of that, did you have enough to charge Mr. Kasukos with this triple homicide? Objection. Sustained. The question is, did you charge him? Did you... Submit charges for Luke Kasuga. I did not.
Now, you were not necessarily the detective that went out and collected all of these surveillance videos from the different locations that you believe may have been relevant, correct? I was not. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to review those items? I did. May I just Cross examination. So you started off by getting a call on the 5th asking you to go to 1105 Mohawk Street, right? I don't know that I was asked to go there. I was asked to go to the St. Mary's Hospital. Okay, but you did go to Mohawk Street afterwards. Yes, I did. Okay, and you have testified in your direct examination that you were present for the execution of a search warrant at that location? I was. Okay. Okay, do you recognize those photos? I do. All right, and so the state talked to you briefly in the direct examination about there were guns and narcotics that were found at 1105 Mohawk Street, which is Mr. Borkagel's home, correct? Correct. Um, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of guns and drugs at that house, correct? Yes. All right, and in addition, to that, during the course of the search warrant, when you were looking for evidence in the home, there was a point where you had to actually evacuate that property and even leave the deceased bodies there, right? We did. Okay, and tell the jury why that happened. There was a, um, what we thought was a bomb, and we had to call in the bomb squad from Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office to come look at it and see if it was a working bomb or do whatever they do with it. Right. In your conversations with Mr. Warpagel, you learned that he had built that bomb. Correct. Right? Okay. Judge State wants to approach on 7A through H. Okay. And so I'm going to show you, Detective, what I've marked 
as defense exhibit seven, eight through H. Okay. Let's go look at those. Mm -hmm. In the previous objection, so admitted. So, in addition to the weapons, the bomb, and the other drugs that are recovered here, one of the things that anyone would notice when they first came <coughs> into Mohawk Street was that it was pretty disorganized, and there were drugs and things that were just laying out in the open. There were drugs in the open, yes. Okay. You walk in on the carpet in the front, there is this item, partially smoked marijuana cigarette, right? Okay. Um, you walk into a room, and we have this right here in the kitchen, the counter space that has what we call a bomb sitting on the counter. Yes. Right? Yep. The kitchen counter or the island that there's in the middle of the kitchen, there's just loose marijuana scattered about. Yes. More partially smoking marijuana cigarettes laying on the counter. All right? Yes. Okay. Fairly large pieces of marijuana that are just laying about on countertops. Correct. Right? In one of the rooms, there is a back room that actually has what you might consider a packaging table that had some of these small glass scenes and a board for cutting, scissors, right? Yes. Okay. What's a trap house? I don't know. You don't know what a trap house <laughs> no. is? You did, in fact, did you look at Mr. Warpable's, um Phone records, the extraction of his phones. I did. Okay. And do you remember seeing Mr. Vorpagel actually referring to the trap house and the trap queen? I don't remember that. Okay. So after you started your investigation at Mohawk Street, you've told us that there were two other scenes. One of them was at I-95, and one of them was at Paseos Way, correct? correct? And the vehicle that is at Paseos Way is eventually determined to be this BMW, right? Yes. Okay. And you were present for the search of the BMW. I was. One of the things that is recovered from the BMW is a business card for an individual named Luke Kasukas. Correct. All right, and it is a business card that describes the business as Luxuria Motor Cars. Right. And so I'm sure that one of the things that you did with this vehicle was you checked the registration of the vehicle. Correct. Okay, and it is not registered to Mr. Vasada. It is not. And it is not registered to Mr. Katsukos. It is not. It is not registered to Mr. Stewart. It is not. Okay, it's registered to a man named Kipper. David Kipper. David Kipper. Okay. Now, Mr. Vorpagel was here yesterday and talking to us about the fact that Mr. Kasukos rented these luxury cars. Correct. Did you learn that during the course of your investigation? I did. Okay. And that vehicle, the BMW, was one of those cars that he would rent out. He, when we spoke to Mr. Kipper about the car, he said that he was leaving the country for several months and he asked Mr. Kasukos to see if somebody would take over the payments while he was gone. And we subsequently found out that um, Chris Vasada took those over. Well, he wasn't paying the money directly. I don't know 
who who was paying money to who. I mean, I believe it was Luke Kasuka's paying David right. Kipper. Right, Mr. Kasukas was paying the money. Correct. Right? Okay. And Mr. Kipper did not know Mr. Visada. He did not. He did not have an arrangement with Mr. Visada. He did not. Okay. So all you know about this is that Mr. Kasukas has a number of luxury cars that he rents out. Correct. To different people. Correct. And he also drives them himself. I, I believe he does. Okay. And so the vehicle that is actually located there in Paseus Way, the BMW, you talked to us briefly about some of the things that were recovered in the vehicle. Um, in addition to those items of ammunition and so forth, one of the processes for actually processing this vehicle for evidence is that the CSIs would take swabs of things from inside the vehicle. Yes. You never requested that any of those items be tested. The swabs from the vehicle? From the BMW. I don't believe I did. In the vehicle, in addition to those swabs of the vehicle, there were things like water bottles. Yes. Empty water bottles that were recovered, that they swabbed those. Those swabs were not tested. I don't believe they were. Okay, so in fact, in terms of the vehicle itself and the actual processing of that vehicle, um, there was no attempt to obtain DNA, which would tie an individual as the driver of the vehicle. I don't believe that was sent down now. Okay. And <coughs> you talked about this video that you showed the jury briefly. And that black and white video, you see the vehicle that we ultimately come to know is the BMW, right? right? But in that particular video, the vehicle actually stops and then goes around again, right? Correct. And when it goes around, it is going in the direction off camera where that FPL road is. Okay, and it would actually pass closer to it by driving around that block in that direction. It would. So when you see the vehicle and you see two people come out of the vehicle, it's difficult to watch, but you don't see anybody carrying that rifle. I, could, I couldn't tell now. Okay, so you've already told us in direct examination that that access road is not often traveled. The foot traffic is very light at night. Correct. Um, and you don't know whether or not somebody, a third or a fourth person, actually drove to that access road and dropped somebody off with weapons before going back to park. I do not. All right, in addition to that vehicle, you've told us that there was a vehicle that was recovered on I-95, right? Yes. And you saw that vehicle later after it was towed. Correct. You were also informed of the evidence that was recovered in the culvert underneath I-95. Correct. And we've talked about two sweatshirts that were present at the scene. Which scene? At I-95. A sweatshirt and another shirt. Like okay. a hoodie and, a, and another shirt. Well, there was a hoodie inside the vehicle. Correct. Right? And that hoodie actually had blood on it, was in the back seat. Correct. Okay. And there is a hoodie that is under I-95 that does not have blood on it. Correct. Okay. The key fobs that you are talking about that match the BMW are in the hoodie that is in the culvert under I-95. Correct. Okay. Now you've told the state in direct examination that you obtained a number of search warrants in this case for DNA, correct? Yes. One of them was for uh, Mr. Visada. Yes. Okay. And when you obtain a search warrant, you actually have to go in front of a judge, correct? Um, the search warrants are actually um, on the computer now. 
So the only time that you would have to actually go in front of the judge is uh, for an arrest warrant. So they're done um, computer now. Okay, so you send them to the judge by computer. Correct. All right. So just as an example in this case, I'm just going to mark for ID um, this search warrant that you obtained for Mr. Kasukas that you just spoke of. And we'll mark it as defense eight for identification. Okay. So that's the type of affidavit that you would submit in order to obtain a search warrant. Correct. And you need to lay out um, probable cause, a basic legal basis for why you would be able to stop someone. You actually, on a search warrant for DNA, you take them into custody, take them down to the police station, take the, the swab of their cheek there. Not all the time. Sometimes okay. we do. Sometimes we do it at the jail. Sometimes if I go to somebody's house and they're willing to s submit to it there, I'll do it there. Okay. Um, so, but you have to lay out a legal basis, a factual and legal reason why this evidence is necessary. Correct. And so for Mr. Rosada, you were able to obtain a search warrant because obviously he had been shot, right? Yes. He was located less than a mile from Mohawk Street. Correct. Within a few minutes of the shooting actually being reported. Correct. Right. You've told us that he made a statement to you about being at Mohawk Street. Correct. Which was denied by Mr. Vorpagel. Correct. Okay. And that was sufficient for you to obtain a search warrant for his DNA. Correct. Okay. Mr. Stewart, Marcus Stewart, who is a second individual charged in this case. Mr. Stewart, you also obtained a search warrant for his DNA? You did. And that was based upon a CODIS hit? Correct, on evidence, right, that we recovered. Okay. And that just means that when they processed some evidence, they got a positive DNA response from the system from, for Marcus Stewart. <coughs> And that was sufficient to ask for his DNA to compare against everything. Correct. Okay. And for Mr. Kasukas, you had to establish similar reasoning. Correct? Correct. But Mr. Kasukas, as our DNA lab told us, did not come up as an affirmative hit for the DNA. Right? And what was your argument for why Mr. Kasukas' DNA would be taken? based on statements of Marcus Stewart. Because Marcus Stewart put him there. Correct. Um, okay. You've also told us that saw Mr. Rosada there and saw his injuries and took photographs of him or had photographs taken. Correct. Okay. And so I, these have already been marked as defense six, A through D.
Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. And are those a fair representation of what Mr. Hassan's injuries look like post-surgery? Correct. I would offer you some evidence, sir. Admitted. high-powered rifle. <coughs> that's what he, that's what the doctor said. Now, Mr. Kasukas, in addition to obtaining the DNA, you also requested that there be some surveillance of Mr. Kasukas? I don't know if I specifically did, but we decided yes. Okay. And you talked, and the state said you talked to an alibi witness for Mr. Kasukas. Correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Kasukas claimed that he was home at the time of this incident. Sustained. And you obtained video from Mr. Kasukas's home for February 5th of 2017. I did. Okay. Mr. Kasukas was actually living in the Abacoa area? Yes. Okay. Do you have copies of your reports with you, detective? I do. Okay. I don't know if yours are numbered the same, so Probably I'm not. wondering if I can give you this one that has the actual stamp number here at the top. Sure. Okay. And so with that said, would you look at page 26?
All right. And so um, with Mr. Kasukas, who was living at Town Center Drive in Jupiter, you obtained a video, correct? correct. That was surveillance video from February 5th, 2017 at 1600 hours or four o'clock in the afternoon until February 6, 2017 at 0600 hours, which would be 6 a.m., right? Yes, but I believe they actually, but I believe they actually got maybe a little bit extra from that. It might have been more than that. Okay. Um, but what you see on that video is that there's an actual entrance. There's an actual entrance to that residence, and you see Mr. Kasukos entering that residence with someone else at 4.54 p.m. on February 5th, 2017. Correct. And you see him leave again at 18.35 or 6.35 hours. Correct. Right, and return again at 18.38 or 6.38 p.m., Correct. right? Yes. Again, he um, comes and goes again at 18.46 or 6.46, leaving um, with another individual, right? At 6.46, he, he comes into the... I'm sorry, he comes in, right? And that individual that he's with then comes back out the front of the residence, right? I'm sorry, say that again? That individual that he originally entered with leaves at 7.06, 19.06, right? The one that he enters with at 6.46 p.m. Okay. At 7.20 p.m., there are actually three individuals wearing dark clothing that are observed outside the residence. Correct. Okay. And you don't specifically see um, Mr. Kasukos leaving again that night. You don't. Okay. But in the morning, you see him coming back in. Correct. Okay. So that video sur surveillance does not corroborate um, his story that he was at home. Right, I can't say whether he left or not. All right. In addition, Mr. Kasukas, you've seen him yourself, right? I have. And tell us what Mr. Kasukas looks like. He has dreadlocks. He's muscular. Um, white male. I think he's Greek. Um, Tattoos? Tattoos, right, all over. Um, you've seen his, his Instagram photos? I have. Has gold grills in his teeth? He, in some photos he does. Yes, okay. So in following up in this case, one of the things that is sort of routine for you now is to obtain phone records. Correct. And in some cases, if you actually get the physical phone in your hands, we can do what we call an extraction through a computer program. Correct. Right? And in this case, you had a number of phones that you physically had in custody. Right. Right? You had Mr. Vorpagel's phone. Yes. And you had Mr. Vasada's phone. Yes. The flip phone. Um, you had Mr. Stewart's phone. Correct. Right? And you were able to do extractions or take all of the information off of those phones. Correct. Okay? And with regard to Mr. Kasukas, you did not physically have his phone. You did, however, based on his business card, have his phone number. Yes. And as a result of that, you sought and obtained a search warrant for Mr. Kasukas's phone records. Correct. Okay. Nine 
It actually should be nine. And it's just for ID purposes at this juncture. Show those to you, detectives. Okay. Um, you've seen these extractions before done by Jupiter Police Department. Yes. You were aware that these extractions had been done in this case. Yes. Um, and in fact, in your supplement that you filed, the one we've referenced, you talked about um, some of the text messages and phone calls that go back and forth between people. Correct. Okay. And specifically as to Mr. Rosario's phone, he's seen the extraction of that, correct? Yes. And in Mr. Vorpagel's residence, I'm going to mark this for 11, as 11. I'm going to show you what it's marked as 11 <coughs> in the search warrant for Mr. Borkegel's house at 1105 Mohawk Street. There were some documents that were recovered there. Okay. Some of them, I, I know you've listed, they've listed in evidence as being like drug ledgers, um, notes, but there was also this handwritten list of phone numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, do you recall seeing that list of phone numbers from the residents? I don't specifically remember it. I mean, I'm sure I did, but I don't. I looked at a lot of stuff. So okay. This one in particular, I don't specifically remember. Does the state have an objection? That's fine. All right. So you want to admit it now? That's 11, if my memory serves me correct. Okay, 11's admitted. So Mr. Kasukos's number from his business card was 561-346-3604. Do you want me to show you the card? Do you want to see it? No, I believe you. Okay. All right. And from the list that Mr. Vorkagel had in his home, um, he has Mr. Henry's number as 561-598-4042. Okay. And Chris Vasada as 561-537-0663. And of course, Mr. Vorpag Mr. Vorpagel's phone was 561-510-3317. And those phone numbers, I mean, the Jupiter Police Department actually um, made an attempt to create a document, an Excel document, that contained all of the information for all the phones that were recovered. Right? Yes. To see the interaction between them. Correct. Okay. So you're aware of, clearly aware of Mr. Um, Vorpagel's phone number, Mr. Vasada's, Mr. Henry's, um, and Mr. Kasukas's when that was done? Yes. Okay. Did you look at Mr. Vasada's phone records closely? for the day of the incident and the weekend of the incident? Specifically, mostly the day of the incident and right around that time. Okay. And did you notice that Mr. Vasada had phone calls with Charlie 
and text messages with Charlie? Yes. And that he also had phone calls and text messages with Luke Kasukas? Yes. And also with Sean Henry? Yes. Okay. And were you aware based on those phone records that on the second and the third preceding this incident that there were a number of interactions where you see Luke, Luke, Charlie, Luke, Luke, Sean, Henry? I don't specifically remember that, no. Okay. Never asked, um, because you didn't pick that up, you didn't ask Mr. Vorpagel about that? I don't remember asking him about that, no. Okay. Just one moment, Judge. Any redirect? Yes, of course. Here's your cut. Jurors okay to just so we finish with this witness and then we'll take a short break. Anybody need it now? Yes. Okay. That settled the dispute. <laughs> All right. So jurors, uh, five to ten minute break. Grab yourself some coffee snack. Remember, you can bring it out to your chair. I don't mind at all. And we'll see you back shortly. Don't talk about the case. Watch your step. And we'll be with you in a moment. Lawyers take that same opportunity. And I'll see you back shortly. Finish up with the statement. You cannot talk to anybody about the case right now, okay? But you're free to go out and use the restroom as well. Is it okay if I leave this? Absolutely. 